How beautiful is that? Thank you, Cassie. And thank you, Donna. I never knew all that about camels. <laughs> there was a married couple that had been married for 40 years, and they were in their early 60s. And as they were celebrating their 40th anniversary, they were in a quiet little romantic restaurant. And suddenly, a tiny yet beautiful fairy appeared on their table. The fairy said, for being such an exemplary married couple and for being loving to each other, for all this time, I will grant each of you a wish. The wife answered, just smiling from ear to ear, Oh, I want to travel around the world with my darling husband. The fairy waved her magic wand and poof, here were two tickets for the Queen Mary to appear in her hands. She ready to set sail. The husband thought for a moment, very introspective. He said, well, this is a very romantic opportunity, but he said, an opportunity like this will never come again. So I'm sorry, my love, but my wish is to have a wife 30 years younger than me. The wife and the fairy were deeply disappointed. But a wish is a wish, the fairy said. So the fairy waved her magic wand, and poof, he became 92 years old. <laughs> <laughs> the moral of this story is husbands need to remember that fairies are female. <laughs> I want you to repeat along with me what we have on the screen. I am created in the likeness and image of God. Therefore, whatever God is, I am. And this is the truth about me. How do you feel after you repeat that and repeat it with gusto? How does it, how does it resonate within you? Do you feel, uh, well, I'm going to let you answer that on your own. December is the month when we celebrate the birth of Jesus into our dream here. January is the beginning of the new year when the standard church lectionary leads us into the start of this Jesus story of where he's teaching us a new way of seeing things, a new way of thinking. And in the gospel reading from John in chapter 1, Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael as his first disciples to follow him. In the different gospels in the Bible, uh, this is a shock to some of you that take it literally, but anyhow, different ones call different ones as their first disciples. But in John, Jesus called Philip and Nathanael. But as he called them today, let's look at his call as our call, his call to us to follow him. In the gospel reading from Mark in 127, as he was <clears throat> teaching in the synagogue, they said to each other, they were all amazed and kept asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? They had never heard anything like Jesus was teaching. It's amazing to me in the calendar year versus the church year, uh, here we are celebrating the birth of Jesus, and then we immediately go into his ministry, then we have his crucifixion, and then we go on about his teachings and things. I never understood why it was that way, but I didn't write the Bible, so. We celebrate the birth of the Christ consciousness within us. That's what the birth of the baby Jesus represents to us the one who brought to us a new understanding of this creator called God. Jesus is the central figure in Christianity, both Catholicism and Protestantism and Eastern Orthodoxy as well as all New Thought religions. 
No one in history has had as much impact on the Western world as this one that we affectionately call Jesus. What was this good news that he brought to us? How has it impacted our lives? And what have we done with this information and his teaching? The good news that he brought to us and kept reiterating it over and over was we are one with each other, one with him, and most certainly one with God. He came to introduce us to his thought process, which is the thought process of the Holy Spirit that was given to us. We were using the world's thought process prior to this, and we were obviously messing it up. So he reinterpreted all of this for us. Remember when he was giving us the Sermon on the Mount? He said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. So he was giving it to us as we had heard it, but then he was correcting or reinterpreting it for us. He did not come, he said, to abolish the law, but to reinterpret it for us. Why? We weren't understanding it. We were missing the mark. We were missing the point, especially like on the Ten Commandments. Jesus was asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of them all? And he answered, Love God with all your heart and all your soul, and the second is likened to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then he said something very profound. This is what I want you to hear. These two, he was asked which one was the greatest, but he gave two. He said, these two fulfill all the laws and the prophets. We had all kinds of laws. We had all kinds of prophets. But here Jesus is telling us that these two fulfill everything, everything. He again then simplified it more. And now I give you a new commandment. Love ye one another. So we went from recently the Ten Commandments down to one. Simplified the whole thing. The thing about us loving God with all our heart and all our soul. And the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. What are we saying when we don't love our neighbor? Well, we don't love ourselves. That's one thing that is. And we don't believe any of it. I love in the Course in Miracles where it says, you either believe all of it or you believe none of it. You can't pick and choose. You can't pick and choose the things that Jesus brought to us and taught to us and fulfill what he came to teach us. With Jesus' thought process, he tells us that we have only one problem. We think we're separate from God. That's what he came here to correct for us. And one solution, which we find through forgiveness. We must forgive ourselves. That's the only one to forgive. Forgive ourselves for thinking that we even have the power to separate ourselves from that which God created. We don't. That's the joke. That's the laugh when we do that. Remember in Genesis 127 that we all repeated, we are created in the likeness and image of God, so whatever God is, we are. The world is full of change. Nothing stays the same. But heaven is changeless. I'll never forget a time Monica had come home and was telling me about a friend of hers who was troubled and depressed. And after listening to him for a while, she was reminding him of the peace that comes to us when we see things through the eyes of heaven or the Holy Spirit or God and that this peace never changes, never changes. For in heaven, things are changeless. 
And we can give our worldly thoughts to the Holy Spirit or to Jesus, and they will reinterpret it for us. They will show us their way of seeing. We can get through all kinds of trouble and depression, and all of that can be changed to one of happiness, peace, contentment, joy. But this person said to Monica, he says, well, but I like change. I like something different all the time. Never changing sounds dull and boring. Is that where we are? Are we giving away everything which God gave us, and he gave us everything, for less than or for this soap opera called Life, which is filled with all kinds of ups and downs and ins and outs. Look at what Jesus was trying to tell us and bring to us, that we were created in this likeness and image, with it, which it has no need at all, and we gave it away for what we call this world and what I call the soap opera called life. Let me paint you a picture and again, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. While you listen to some truth about you, just listen. Now, metaphysically transport yourself out of the physical. Transport yourself into the spiritual. And listen to this. God is love and God is spirit. And you are created in the likeness and image of God. Therefore, you are pure love and pure spirit. Everything is already given you. Everything. Nothing is lacking in heaven. Pure love has no needs. It is everything. Pure spirit has no hurts or pains. And since there is no body, there is no sickness. There is not one thing that you could want. There is nothing you need ask for. Just accept that which has already been given, given you. Being pure love, all we can do is to extend love. And this is what we do. There is no opposite. There is no other. There is only one. There is only oneness. All we need do is to share or extend this love, which is what we are just pure love, a state of total peace, total joy, and it never changes. Your heart is filled to capacity with everything to keep you wholly joyous, totally peaceful, and totally in a state of being. Now let's come back to here. What do we see now with our eyes open? How did we get here if all of that other that we just thought about was the real truth about us? Well, in a moment of insanity, we decided to trade heaven for this chaos, confusion, for lack of all kinds. So welcome to the world of the ego. You don't like changelessness. Well, here we are in a world of constant change. So enjoy. However, I have the good news for you. Your original state is changeless, and that is where we really are. But in our dream here, we think we are separate. But when we wake up, we will see things as they really are and always have been. So forgive yourself right now for thinking that you even have the power to separate yourself from God. Mystics of every age and spiritual tradition testify that everyone is on a journey, 
The, de the destination is what we call our real home. And we are all assured of this homecoming in all traditions. We cannot change what God created, and he created us one with him. And someday, sometime, each of us will come to know this as the truth for ourselves. Jesus' message was constant. I am the Father, the Father's in me, and I am in you also. There is only one, and that's the sonship of God. In Hinduism, which is a system of philosophy that further develops the implications of the Upanishads, that all reality is a single principle, Brahma, or God, and teaches that the believer's goal is to transcend the limitations of the self-identity and realize one's unity with Brahma or with God. Very, very similar to that being exactly the same thing as we talk about in Christianity. From A Course in Miracles in chapter 15 about the holy instant, we hear these words. This lesson takes no time, for what is time without a past and future? It has taken time to misguide you so completely, but it takes no time at all to be what you are. Begin to practice the Holy Spirit's use of time as a teaching aid to happiness and peace. Take this very instant right now, this instant right now, and think of it as all there is of time. Nothing can reach you here out of the past. And it is here that you are completely absolved, completely free, and wholly without condemnation. Right here, right now, in this holy instant. From this holy instant wherein holiness was born again, you will go forth in time without fear and with no sense of change with time. Time is inconceivable without change, yet holiness, holiness does not change. Learn from this instant more than merely that hell does not exist. In this redeeming instant lies heaven. And heaven will not change. For the birth into the holy present is salvation from change. There is no change in heaven because there is no change in God. In the holy instant in which you see yourself as bright with freedom, you will remember God. For remembering him is to remember freedom. I invite you all now to study the truth and effectiveness of symbolically being called by Jesus 